knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, coming to you live from the Waywalker Studios at Vegas All Net Radio. Today uh, we have our standard crew. I'm Kurt, your host. We have William Beach Baker, uh, Mike McCullough, hello, Perry Haichu, and our guest today is Cindy Orser from Digipath Labs, and of course we have Lawrence in there making us sound great all the time. So yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Welcome, Cindy. How yeah, are you? thank you. I'm glad to have you on yeah, the show. Thank you. Um, so you're with Digipath Labs. Yes. <laughs> which is a medical cannabis testing facility here in Las Vegas, correct? Correct, mm-hmm. correct. So um, we've been open not quite a year. Yeah, so about a year. Uh, you guys um, do testing for how many? You have a how many samples we've tested? No, or how, 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 how many, many shops are you kind of tracking with? You taking care of? Uh, well, I think there are about 20 grows that are up and running right now, and wow. we have... I don't know about eighty uh, percent of the business. <laughs> okay. I Good market share. <laughs> yeah, well, your guys, your pricing seems to be very reasonable compared to a lot of the pricing I've seen from the mm-hmm. lab association. Yeah, I think our pricing. I mean, we were very realistic at the outset. Um, you know, we did a cost analysis and came up with what we thought was very fair for both our clients as well as ourselves. So it seems to be working out. And as patients, we, we thank you for that because well, <laughs> obviously the lower cost to test the medicine, that comes down yeah, of course. to us. So. Of course. You know, and, and, it, and it is all about quality assurance for the patients. So, mm-hmm. Well, speaking of, uh, I kind of want to jump around a little bit. I mean, totally off topic from that, but um, are patients allowed to come to your facility and submit their product no, for testing at this time? Unfortunately, the state of Nevada does not allow that. Okay. That's something that would be nice. Have uh, you heard a demand from patients? Do people yes, call you yes, uh, often we, asking yes, for that? Yes, we have continual demand from the patients. Uh, asking if they can come and drop off samples. And this is a service that is provided for patients in California, I know, and and other states. Yeah, well, you know, every state seems to do it their own way. Is that and like an ILAC commission decision, or would that take no, a legislative fix yeah, during session? Yeah, I think it would have okay. to be at the legislative level. Yeah, and, I, and they're, they're aware of that. That's been brought up at the uh, Nevada Marijuana Council, mm-hmm. and uh, TIC is aware of it, and it's something that we're, that they're working on, right. and hopefully we'll have here in the near future. Um, Hopefully it won't be the same amount as <laughs> it is. Oh, the, the price? The yeah, the, the price. Well, I guess, well, I mean, one thing that would be nice if, if we mm-hmm. were dealing with patients is if they could just choose from the menu, uh, you know, our testing menu, what it is that they were interested mm-hmm. in having tested. If, it, if they were right, worried exactly. about pesticides or if it was right. potency, mm-hmm. whereas now the way it's set up the state we can't just do one or two tests on a sample. We have to do the the whole panel. Okay. So all the terpenes. So so that's one reason you know that dictates the price, just because it's so much hands on with every sample that comes into the lab. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't you tell us about some of the tests that you actually do for the well, mar- okay. marijuana dispensaries? Let's yeah. Say. So. Well, we, you know, we don't really test for the dispensaries. It's, it's the growers, Good unless growth. the dispensary happens to have a grow. So, um, well, when the samples first come into us, uh, of course, chain of custody is very important. So we barcode the sample, and that goes into our laboratory information management system, which we'll okay. call LIMS. And that starts the process of creating the certificate of analysis. So we do a visual inspection, we take a high resolution photograph and we attach that uh, to that sample ID number. Um, Then it moves over and we homogenize the sample and we do that by quick freeze and liquid nitrogen which makes the plant very brittle and we can easily pulverize it in a mortar and pestle. And then we aliquot 
for the various tests. And the first test is for moisture analysis, which is very simple, straightforward. We just weigh a uh, gram out and then totally dry the sample, get the new weight, and from that you can calculate what mm -hmm. the moisture content was. Um, then potency is probably the biggest one that most people are interested in, you know, the THC, CBD. Uh, we analyze for 11 cannabinoids and we're scaling that up to B17. And the reason it was 11 and it's going to 17 is because that's the a number of certified reference standards that are available because all of our testing is done by calibrating with reference standards. Mm. So we do the cannabinoids, and that's on a, a high-pressure liquid chromatograph, which separates them all out and quantitates them. And then that data automatically through the limbs gets uploaded and populates uh, the certificate of analysis. The other component of potency are the terpenes. And we analyze for 22 terpenes, again, because that's the number of certified reference standards. Um, that's done by a gas chromat chromatograph coupled to a mass spec. And the reason we use a gas chromatograph is because the terpenes are what give the aroma to the various strains. Mm -hmm. So they're volatile. So it's actually a really simplistic way of doing it. Just heat a little bit of the sample up take a sample of that gas that's volatilized off of it, inject it into the mass spec, and then determine what uh, terpenes are present and how much. And then we move into the quality assurance tests. So pesticides, of course, are a big deal. Um, that's done first by doing an extraction of a sample of the particular um, plant. Um, and then we have to clean the sample up to get rid of some of the complexities that are just inherent to cannabis. I mean, cannabis is one of the most complex biological matrices because okay. the plant, as you know, it's so resinous and it has waxes. And, you know, besides the terpenes, there are hundreds of other high molecular weight compounds. So we clean it up, inject it into the LC triple quad. So here we have three mass specs in tandem. So we first separate by size, then we ionize it, and then it gets fragmented and uh, we look for um, 24 different pesticides, and there are specific tolerance limits that uh, the state, through the ILAC committee, and actually Digipath participated quite actively in that process. Um, Nevada is unique in that it decided to adopt crop group 19, which are herbs and spices, right. Right. for allowable pesticides and also those tolerance levels. Uh, it's the only state that has boldly done something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's worked out really well. Uh, I think once the growers realized what the rules were and what the tolerance levels were, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, we really don't see many failures for pesticide residue, mm -hmm. um, which Very is good. really good news for the patients. Absolutely. Do you see many failures at all at this point? Do most growers basically have it down? Because I heard rumors there were a lot of uh, failed batches at the very beginning. At the Well, yes. So at the very beginning, we when, when um, cultivators made their one-time purchase from home growers, we did have a very high failure rate for both pesticides as well as microbials. Um, but now, uh, pesticides, we, we rarely see failures for pesticides. Um, then additionally, for quality assurance, we also test for heavy metals. Um, we've seen no failures for heavy metals, which was, I think, a big relief early on. Some people in Vegas were concerned that because of the water supply here that there may be heavy metal issues, but we have seen none. And then it moves into the microbial screening, which is a very labor-intensive part of the quality assurance testing. We use a combination of both genomic screening. so. 
We actually isolate the total DNA from a sample, so we get both the plant DNA as well as any microbial DNA uh, from microorganisms that are on the plant material. And then we use a genomic screening technique called qPCR, where we actually amplify regions of the genome uh, if there is a pathogenic E. coli or salmonella present. Mm. We also use that for total yeast and mold. Um, and that's really what has allowed DigiPath to be able to turn all of our samples around within 48 hours. It's because we've embraced genomic screening. Uh, so you don't have to wait for the microorganisms to you know, be visually uh, viewable on a Petri plate, right. which is the more traditional way of right. looking for microbial contaminants. Right. Wow. And then finally, one more thing, <laughs> okay. we also ha screen for mycotoxins, which again really sets uh, Nevada apart that they've gone down to that level. Mm. And that's really because we have to remember that this is medicine, it's medical marijuana, and for those patients who are ill or immunocompromised, it's really a bad idea to... Um, ingest any material that might have mycotoxins because a lot of them are are quite nasty like aflatoxin wow wow that's okay, incredible so, yeah well thank you for that that's mm -hmm. uh, quite detailed <laughs> and uh very very good i only have uh, one question i gotta okay. gotta say something uh, mm -hmm. while you're talking detail yeah. uh this manual that you guys give out and they right. give it out at some of the dispensaries uh, yes like euphoria um I took a tour of your place way oh, back good. when, yes. and I've been to Euphoria, and I've been uh, talked to your staff mm -hmm. all, all about this. And I've got to say, this manual is absolutely incredible. Yes, if I didn't you. know anything, and I was just a, a brand new guy off the street, didn't know anything about medical marijuana or how these things work, or or the different delivery systems, yes, and uh, cannabinoids and all these things. Uh, I'll tell you what, this is wonderful. It's well written. Uh, there's a couple little things in here I might not agree with on the uh, oh, okay. on the uh, <laughs> recreational parts of it of how much uh, edibles a person should oh, have. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we don't quite agree on that. But uh, that's that's. You think uh, we're too uh, high or too one low? incredible, well, incredible so, uh, well, manual. As as a know. patient, uh -huh. uh, I use edibles. So, um, I use edibles for my pain. And I would tell you if you live in Las Vegas, visit the lab, take a tour, do whatever you want to do. Get just get the manual. Yeah. All right, because right. you will love this. You yeah. will love it. Yeah. And so, um, so we're glad to have you. Yeah. So this manual we actually produced as a obviously a marketing educational tool, mm. um, but we co-market it, as you pointed out mm. here. We will co-brand this um, manual with any dispensary, and they can give it out to right. their patients. Right. And we've actually heard from Euphoria that they give out a 1,000 of these a month. Right. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. it is yeah, very and, popular. Um, and there is actually, a, we have a smaller version of it, too. So yes, you do have a smaller make, pocket yeah, version. Yeah, we did. <laughs> okay. and, um, yes, but the we only did. addition I would make a request here uh -huh. to the whole Internet world out there <laughs> is that there's a little resource in here that says uh, up sources that you can get a hold of if you want to get a license or whatever. I'd like you to put uh, We Can in there oh, as okay. a source in your next okay. edition when you right. print this because uh, we're patient advocacy. We're not profit and we certainly we, okay. we love this we love yeah this. Okay. okay yeah definitely so, uh, this is the kind great of stuff, idea this is the yeah. kind of stuff that we can spend teaching patients for eight years and right. right you know what i mean right. it's, it's not all about just smoking cannabis yeah no right. of course it's not the best the best form of relief for most patients you mm -hmm. know what i mean right. mm -hmm. um, absolutely like who is talking about the edible uh, the edible edibles in there right it said 15 milligrams and higher is extremely potent right we would agree with that on on a recreational end but as a medical patient most of us tend to use over 100 milligrams at a time <clears throat> well okay <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah, if you're you know what pain patient uh, yeah. what what what's yeah. high for one person you yeah. know yeah. Would, that's you know, true. Put and it's very true. On the and, couch. And, and edibles <laughs> is a very controversial area. We understand yes. that. Yes. And uh, given time, just like the lab stuff, we're going to work all these things out. Yeah. Us. You know, it's so. better to go right. slow. So you know, yeah. we, we right. want to. Oh, yeah, we we, you know, because you know, a lot of people who are picking this right. up aren't nearly right. as familiar 
with using yeah. medical marijuana. So. Yeah, see, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but one of our board members, Jason Strutman, he's on, on the ILOC yes, committee. Yes, yeah, we and, uh, So we, uh, he, we at WeCran, we have a lot of wonderful professional people right. uh, with us, and so uh, we're, we're just glad to have people like this on board. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, the whole issue of dosing is sort of controversial because... It is. Yeah, it is. Uh, there's not, well, and there be careful about it because... Uh, exact science. I don't know if I read it. Yeah. It becomes an issue of... Of, of dosing is a, a measure of body weight, is a measure of experience and tolerance. Uh, people who are starting Rick Simpson oil uh, at the beginning of a regimen are taking about half the size of a grain of rice. And I've heard some, uh, one patient whose husband said, even with that, she slept for two days and I had a dresser. So it could be even smaller than that. But within right. several weeks, yeah. they get those cancer patients right. up to a gram a day. Yeah. So, you know, from yeah. milligrams to a gram, yeah. that tolerance really builds up individually mm -hmm. with people. Yeah. So it, it is difficult to uh, hone in on um, an exact recommended right. dose. Yeah. I, mean, I think it would no, be more yeah. of a range. There's no universal mm -hmm. answer to that. Definitely yeah. not. Yeah. 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 We always tell people to start slow until you know right. what exactly. you're at. And that's, yeah, that's what time. I love about the, the fact that we have tested medicine now is you know exactly what you're getting. I know. So yeah, it's a big step if, if, you find, if you find that 15 milligrams isn't enough, you can step up to, you know, the next step, 20, 25 milligrams mm -hmm. or so. And once you find your level, yeah, you know that's right. you can feel comfortable taking that amount from the get-go. Yeah. So. I, I'm curious. Um, mm -hmm. You said that your clients tend to be um, uh, the cultivators, right. uh, or I would imagine or production, production facilities, yes. and, and not the dispensaries. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to follow up on that a little bit because, to me, that is a, a points out a, a glaring divergence from what the legislature said and what reality is. The legislature thought, in order to get this. Um, uh, get this industry jump started and also to give patients a, a means of, of getting rid of excess production put in uh, a provision wherein patients could donate or donate anytime or sell one time to a dispensary uh, an amount of medical cannabis and uh, what this what you're telling me here essentially is that no patients have done that and I think part of the reason of that is because what is the the required sample size I heard it was 12 grams? It's 12 grams, 12 grams or, less. or less. Okay, and so if patients were restricted to um, donating or selling two and a half ounces at a time, which is, you know, roughly right. 68 grams right. or so, 70 grams, uh, then if you have to take 12 grams out right. of it, it, do right. it doesn't yeah. make it economically feasible. <clears throat> Even if that's donated, it makes it difficult for a dispensary to mm. justify that cost right. based on the sure. amount they'll have less yeah. for sale. Right. I totally agree. And I, you know, I think the intention is to phase out individual home growers. Originally, that was the deal, but that law has been extended to 2018, and uh, okay. we're not going to let them take that and, away. And from as far as phasing you know. out, uh, this was something that was put in there as a benefit because the growers in this state for uh, for 14 years had to rely on their own means, and many of them spent uh, certainly hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, converting a room and this and that, and, and this was seen as a way to not only get rid of that overage in the transition period, but also to allow them to make something of a financial recoup, uh, given that the trend was to push these people into buying retail uh, at, you know, at licensed facilities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the intent of the legislature did not at all translate into the effect, because right. if you're not getting anything f uh, from dispensaries from testing, that means that whole that whole plan was a failure. Mm. Well, in the very beginning, we we were testing from dispensaries because that was the only way they could get product mm -hmm. on right, their shelves. Right. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. and we did come across that issue that right. they they had such small lots uh, or batch or whatever you want to call right. it that it. It was sort of cost prohibitive to do the testing, mm -hmm. um, but because that was the only thing available, I mean, they did uh, follow yeah, through. Got to do what you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that comes down to the the limits they have on us for grow. I mean, there's there's absolutely no way that you know growing indoors with twelve plants that you're going to produce five pound batches. <laughs> it just it's it's no. just you not, know, likely. not likely. Not no. likely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the cost of trying to grow that. I mean, and then you're then you're looking at the that's, fact what i was just saying like you could do it but 
the amount of power you would use and like it would cost you a fortune yeah. just to do it indoors. All right. Well, mm-hmm. you, you also mentioned um, that you measure, you dry it out and, and weigh it so you can measure the moisture. Uh, and I'm curious as to uh, what the average o- over time that you've seen now moisture level is of product coming in because uh, yeah. people who are selling moisture laden plants are selling more water and, and yes. less cannabinoids. Mm. Very observant of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say the average is eight to ten percent. So yeah, you, that's you're buying eight to ten percent water. Mm. And <laughs> actually we've had a ongoing discussion both internally at DigiPath and with um, the Division of Public Health about whether or not we shouldn't be um, normalizing all of our data f- to dry weight mm-hmm. so that w- you would remove that uncertainty going forward in time because w- we don't know that the sample is going to be maintained at 8 to 10 percent moisture once it leaves our lab. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more accurate scientific result would be to subtract the water component right Mm -hmm. but so the the good news is the potency numbers would go up the bad news is if that is divulged to um, the dispensary buying the product then the grower will be feeling that discounted weight so Mm -hmm. the, the weight of their product would also go down yeah, but given time, they would get used to that b- being the actual way. Right, right. right. You know. So, you know, I mean, that's something it would. I would love to take a little survey. Maybe you guys could ask people that come yeah. in here whether <laughs> or not that's something that they would yeah. like to see happen. Is yeah. uh, And it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It, it no, is a it really standardization. Right. Never thought right. of it like that before. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon yeah. me? I've never thought of it like that before. I yeah. mean, obviously, when... In California, it's done a little bit differently. They just kind of you bring it in and you you look at it and you have to kind of determine there on the on the fly. Oh. And of course, if it's too, too if wet. it's too wet, of course you're not going to take it. But I've never actually thought to really try to mentally subtract like you know how much water weight is this? Should we pay them this much less right. for this cannabis because right. it's this much wetter and this and that? Like that's never even mm. come well, to like, my mind you know, as being an I mean, industry standard you, before. You go and you pay twenty dollars a pound for a steak Mm -hmm. and you like it happened to me last night i made stir fry i had a steak and i slice it up and i put it in the pan and it's like it's like 30 percent water yeah and so they do that routinely in the meat yeah, industry, do. so let us yeah, not fall that. into that. I agree. Fair <laughs> let us not fall into those same traps. Well, I have another strange question for you, we're kind of circling back. Uh, you were talking about taking the plant DNA mm-hmm. or plant DNA genome profile in your testing. Does that mean that you can determine what strain you're testing? Like, if I just gave you a random bud out of my pocket, a 12-gram sample, and, and you could test it, could you tell if it was sour diesel or OG or whatever? Can you? Is that possible? Well, right actually, now? that the the answer, the short answer is yes, but I'm not no good at way. short answers. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you do yeah. that? How is well, that possible? Well, okay, so that this is a new service that Digipath just launched. Hmm. 10 days ago, two weeks ago, which is now we do offer genotyping service mm-hmm. to growers. So you, you know, as a patient with your 12 grams, you you wouldn't want to pay for that service no, because of co- of course. It's, it's actually, uh, you know, a lengthy process, um, the, the sequencing. Okay. We do not do the sequencing on site. We have a collaborator. It's medicinal genomics out of uh, Massachusetts. Those individuals were uh, principal in the Human Genome Project, so they're very well versed at sequencing complex genomes, and plants have the most complex genome. But who assembled um, the database? Like, how, if I have. That's an ongoing thing. Yeah, like, if a grower yeah. comes in and they're like, yeah. I have this Louis the 13th OG, and it is the best in the whole world, and I guarantee it's the best, and we really have no idea, you know, right. we don't know, but right. how can well, we so, really have that okay, database well, of knowledge? Okay, well, so, so this is a nascent effort, and there's a few uh, groups around the country who are starting to build this legitimate database based on genotyping of samples that come in. Mm-hmm. The reason I 
chose to work with medicinal genomics is because they use the same, and I'm not a computer scientist, but it's the same connect, interconnectivity with uh, basic computer storage. It's, uh, there's a term for it, which I may or may not remember, um, that allows you to um, digitally uh, deposit that sequence in time and space and on all of these publicly accessible computers around the world. So what it does is it gives that grower uh, a timestamp to give them rights to that sequence. And if they want to call that, you know, Blue Angel or whatever, <laughs> that's their proprietary stamp. Um, so that's really what this and, is about. And, and so then that, then they use that to start building out this phylogenetic tree, this association of strains that have been genotyped. Um, so the quicker people jump on board, the higher likelihood they have of getting a proprietary position with regard to the genotype of their favorite strain. Right. So this is not philanthropic in nature. People aren't doing this for the good of the community. They're doing this in a more capitalistic mindset to where to I want, strains. yeah, I yeah. want rights, exclusive rights to Blue Dream, or I yeah. want exclusive rights to this, that, or the well, other. It's, it, well, I, I, you know, I don't think it's quite that vain, but... Um, it, you know, because it is publicly accessible. So, it, you know, the information is being shared. But what I believe is that for the cannabis industry to advance further into being an accepted, legitimate industry, um, and particularly at the federal level, is that we need to move away from this strain naming game and uh, all the, there's been, uh, you know, a hundred years of amateur plant breeding going <laughs> on. You're and, not kidding. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you can look, there was a paper published, it's probably been two years ago now, um, by John Page, who's a researcher in British Columbia. And they went out and bought, I think, 85 strains. And they, they didn't, of course, sequence the whole genome because that's too laborious, but they sequenced, I think, 10,000 SNPs, so 10,000 unique sequences. And then they, uh, from that, they determined if they were indica or sativa from the sequence data. Um, and compared it to the ancestry information that they were given when they bought it. So say somebody said, oh, yep, this is 100% indica, and it's, you know, whatever name, tangerine haze. Um, and then from their actual sequence data, they could determine what percent indica it really was. And it was all over the place. Of course. A strain was more likely to be indica than anything. I mean, it's sad. The sativa strains that still exist, particularly in North America, have been pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. And it's because of all of this amateur breeding that's gone on with one one selective trait, which is high THC. Mm -hmm. And so it's you can see it when he lines these strains all up that 80%, 85% of everything is indica, whether they say it's hybrid or even right. if they say it's sativa. Yeah. Well, that's sort of like the Ancestry.com yeah. commercial that's running where the guy is, is in lederhosen and thinks he's German and then sends <laughs> oh, in right. and he finds yeah. out he's Scottish. Yeah. 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 But I, I wouldn't be so quick to, to dismiss uh, all this amateur breeding. Grigor Mendel was a was an amateur when he was crossing oh, bean, beans and determining recessive and, and dominant traits. And, and amateur breeders under the face of state and federal oppression over the course of the last 70 plus years have taken your three basic strains of, of sativa, indica, and ruderalis and come up with thousands of, of varieties of that. Oh, no, it's and, true. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not that they only um, were looking for THC, but since cannabinoids hadn't even been discovered until 1964 by Raphael right. McCollum, you right. know, they were right. just 
going for yeah. an No, event. no, you're right. I right. mean, I should have, a better way to phrase it is that they were doing their plant breeding in isolation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. there wasn't a public forum. There was not well, that a, we can agree there with. Was the first only... rule of growing is never tell anybody, never show anybody <laughs> you grow. Right, and, uh, right. Well, I think the other, how about this? When I was working in California, it seemed like, of course, like you said, 80, 85 percent of the, the vendors or guys with backpacks who would come in trying to sell us their medicine uh, so had in Colorado all the time. had OGs mostly. That's all you see is right. in Southern California is OGs or OG varieties. And of course, it's not like it is the THC content, but it's the speed of flowering and it's the heavy yield also because it's like, you know, the sativas just take so much longer and you're not going to be able to get any more money for it. Like if I have a pound of excellent super sour diesel or, you know, uh, amnesia haze or even Neville's haze, which is a really, you know, that you never see it anymore because it takes 13, 14, 15 weeks to flower yeah. compared to right. a, uh, uh, like a, uh, what's a good OG? A- any OG, you know, pay, you know there's a, done, a ton of, there's yeah, a million of them, but they take what, eight to nine weeks at the most? Mm-hmm. And you're well, flowering so, yeah. and you're, mm-hmm. you're yielding and, and maybe the, even more? You're and bringing up a really good point. You're yeah, and that's why really you're seeing the, uh, the injection into some of these strains by breeders uh, attempting to cross Root or Allison because Root or Allison coming from the Russian steppes is an auto flowering, a much shorter period. So they're trying to, to bring in not only the high THC that you mentioned or high CBDs, but they're, they're trying to bring in that quicker turn oh always got to do it faster yeah. yeah yeah and then not only the fact that the quicker turn the 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 shorter your your flowering time is the less chance you're going to run into mold mildew <laughs> yeah, and all that other stuff <laughs> the longer it's in your room the longer the more chance yeah see that that, that hadn't even crossed my mind once again because i have never really gotten to I, I ran a few grows like maybe uh, when i was younger or whatever with my card but never on a mass scale to where i had the the time to really uh, notice those yeah. those yeah. distinctions between the growth cycles. Like uh, for me, it was just well, you know, if I'm running this 14 week cycle and eight week cycle, I can run three more a year easily or more in a, in a season. So the the yeah. it's yeah. obvious what most people are going to lean toward, and it is unfortunate, you know, because I love the sativas, and I think a lot of people do, and we miss yeah, them. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. We miss yeah. them. Hopefully, there'll be like a resurgence in that sometime. With oh, the, I think there with, will with be. The, uh, you know, what, once project. more. What, once it's normalized, yeah, it once, becomes just another crop. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, and that, I don't even think I finished where I was going, but that is what I think has to happen is uh, we need to have more accepted agronomic practices mm-hmm. for how cannabis strains, or they should be called cultivars, arise, um, and how they're grown. All right. Um, I think it's time for us to take our first break. Uh, so we'll be back in just a little bit with more from Cindy Orser from uh, Digipath Labs. And make sure you check out our sponsors, uh, Nevada Pure, Essence Vegas, and Sahara Wellness. <laughs> We can 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Now, here again, the We Can Radio Team. Welcome back to Nevada Cannabis News. Uh, in the uh, Coming to you live from the Waywalker Studio at Vegas All Net Radio. Today we have uh, Cindy Orser from Digipath Labs, and we've been having some great conversation. I had a, co- I had a question. They're starting to see live resins now. I bought some the other day over at Nevada Pure, the God's Gift live resin. Now, you have to dry the, the y- to test the flower, you have to have it to a certain dryness. With a live right. resin, you can't dry it first. How are, how are they going oh, about well, testing no, this? No. Oh, you mean how they cure the flower before we test? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but do you have to test the flower resin? first or do you just test the live resin after it's made from the flower? Oh yeah, no, we, we test the live resin after it's been made. Okay, so you don't have to, okay, okay. I was no. wondering how they were going about that because mm. obviously oh, if you dry yeah. the flower down, no. you're not gonna be oh. able to make a live resin right. from it after no. that point. So. No, no. For those, for those in the audience who may not know, ex- uh, explain what live resin is a little bit more. Well, a live resin is, is an, ex- an extraction process that just basically uses heat and temperature and not doesn't use butane or co2 or anything else else like that to, to pull it off 
What so, do you mean? You use it like a press? Yeah, like, like a rosin. rosin. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so you stick a, a butt under it, and it just presses yeah, and squeezes have, the crap we, we out of it. We actually have a commercial rosin press at almost every one of our events that you know oh, one of our okay. patients right. purchased, right. and it's an Yeah, I got to see one used recently in person. It's they're pretty clever. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't know what it is and want to learn more about it, come to the next weekend party. <laughs> <laughs> like a big giant. As long as you're a patient, we will well, allow you to indulge. Yeah. Okay, There's some folks. people who make it by um, just knocking the trichomes mm. off the flowers mm. and then that's pressing that. That's interesting, too. Yeah, that's a, that it's would be turning keeping. Keep, keeping that would it be and keeping. Then the Yeah. Mind. That's so back in the old days where they would take the keef and they would put it into a cylinder and put apply pressure mm. and heat and right. it would make the hash. Right. Is what they, that's right. the old, old Is there a right. difference between live resin and rosin? Is it the same thing? Yeah. I think it's I think the it's same the thing. thing. It's, it's, it's it? like being on Route 66 or going down south. And okay, it's just what you call. It's just what you call it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No worries. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it just to me, it sounds like hash. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it to me too. Yeah, it, it is a form of hash. But it sounds way. so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes a lot better too. And it's uh, uh, very. I, I generally don't like to ingest live things though. That 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 would be a warning point for me. So let, let me ask you a question. I'm I'm always excited to be educated uh, in in these areas when speaking to very knowledgeable people. Um, you you mentioned a little earlier that uh, terpenes uh, were uh, would affect the potency of the plant, and it, it was my understanding that is volatile oils, terpenes uh, are something that affect the, the aroma, the taste, and all that. And yet at the same time, I recall a, a patient telling me several years ago that they've, uh, they've tried vaping and they've tried the, these extracts and stuff, but they did not get the full body effect the same as they did just smoking flour with those terpenes in it. Right. So even though the, uh, mm. everything I've read said terpenes don't contribute to the uh, psychoactive effects there does seem to be right some evidence for it yeah i mean yeah they i fully believe they don't contribute to the psychoactive component mm -hmm. but you know there's lots of discussion out there about the entourage effects the right. synergistic mm -hmm. components that the terpenes play yeah. the truth is we really don't know because the defined scientific studies haven't been done where you isolate one particular cannabinoid and combine it with one terpene mm -hmm. and then you know measure some clinical output right. you know, there's, there's like a company a called shango that has a uh, uh, recreational facilities up in uh, Oregon uh, I'm, that is now doing exactly that. And, and they're the first ones that I've heard that are attempting to do that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we know of a few uh, different groups that are doing that now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like if you look in this uh, little manual here, booklet, um, there, if you go to the literature and you can as find people ascribing certain effects to specific terpenes. And we, we even know it ourselves because lemonine, right? You get a nice juicy lemon and you get some of that lemonine. I mean, it's uplifting mm. and it's yeah, light. Absolutely. And, you know, there's yeah. something about that odor. Right. Same thing with pining. You know, when you walk into your living room at Christmas and you have your live right. tree there. Well, that's, I mean, that's my theory of lavender. In See, lavender. I can smoke oil. lavender or I can get some oil lavender and I can feel pretty dang good. Y yeah. You so, uh, you know, plants are amazing. Um, yeah. We, I think we just are brushing the surface uh, of the attributes of the cannabis plant. So then in, in the, the salad bowl, which makes up cannabinoids in the plant, where yeah. THC is the lettuce and yeah. maybe CBD is the tomatoes, and you've got all these other cranberries and walnuts yeah. and everything, the, the terpenes are acting almost as a salad dressing to really enhance Well, there you go. The That's experience. a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good metaphor. Yeah, good analogy. Okay. I, I have one more question that I've, mm -hmm. that I've got to ask before we move on to things, which is um, we see that Nevada is moving forward with this whole industry, but with what they were saying at the time were some of the most stringent regulations in the state. And from what I'm hearing from different dispensary owners and all, you know, especially in this area, there there is intense regulation. Do you think that this is just a... Um, a natural outgrowth of the uh, the fear and paranoia from from decades past, or or that you know this degree of regulation is necessary. Do you find any problems with overregulation? Um, are you talking about just in Nevada? Well, I'm, uh, well, yes, I'm talking uh, about the Nevada law. Yeah. At this point. So you know, I think 
Nevada looked around and saw the experience of some of the neighboring states, mm-hmm. California being a big one, Colorado, um, California, where it was just sort of open and free yeah. and it was nonprofit and you don't have to test and yeah. And, you know, they didn't want to go down that road. And, you know, I think we also have to remember that Nevada has grown up on regulation. Even though this is Sin City and people mm-hmm. come here to mm-hmm. get wild and crazy, this is a highly regulated, monitored city. From liquor right? to gambling to prostitution. There, right. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. So in many ways, they just embraced it because it's just one more thing and they know how to do this really well. Mm. And then if they looked at Colorado and they saw what Colorado failed to do, number one, Colorado failed to require any testing for medical marijuana, Mm. which is like, I don't know what they were thinking. Mm. Um, And they didn't address the quality assurance uh, Mm -hmm. for the patient. Right. And so I, we should all be so proud of Nevada. Right. They did a really excellent job, and they took uh, patient safety as number one. Um, and, uh, you know, now I think everybody's sort of used to the cumbersomeness mm-hmm. of it all, but mm-hmm. f- from our perspective, it's moving very smoothly. I mean, there's obviously been some glitches, and you know, it's always difficult, of course, when... Uh, you know, the rules change slightly because you get accustomed to doing things a certain way, but I think everyone has adapted well. I mean, the kinds of things that I would like to see is a uh, lifting of the interstate transport ban for the purpose of testing. Mm -hmm. why, Why should we you know, spend a million and a half dollars building a state-of-the-art testing lab in Vegas, and L.A. is two hours away, Um, why shouldn't we be able to also test samples from California? And in Colorado, why can't we test samples from Wyoming, or even though they're not growing there? Um, But we at DigiPath, I mean, we get inquiries from other states asking us because, you know, we promote ourselves, we promote standardization of testing. They know that Nevada is tested has the most rigorous testing requirements. Which should make everybody in the country want to have their their materials tested in the back. Yes, mm. and we have had that request from other states, but unfortunately our hands are tied. Are you Have you spoken with either Senator uh, Reed or Senator Heller's office on this? I have not, but we have talked to the Attorney General's office about a couple of issues. With the, the U.S. Attorney General? No, no, Nevada in Nev- Nevada. Mm. We, we have had a relationship with the Western Attorney General's group. Um, mm. I was asked to come and speak at their annual meeting about, um, you know, the importance of standardization of testing. So, particularly with the reciprocity in Nevada, mm. right? If I'm a medical right. marijuana patient from Massachusetts right. and I come to uh, Las Vegas for vacation and I would need to get some medicine, you know, right. That's very unique to Nevada, but it would be nice if that patient could be assured that the product he's buying in both, or he or she in either state, is actually right. um, meeting the same standards. Right. That's why American tourists right. go to McDonald's yeah. when they're in Beijing. They know yeah. what they're going to get. Yeah, much. You're right. <laughs> There is actually a race going on across the country with with the 23 states that are legal for mm-hmm. patients, and that race is to build a model for the nation, a model that works for the state like Nevada, but it also works basically across the nation. And it's sort of, that's the way driver's licenses became uniform and everything else. Each state decided how, how to have a driver's license. Mm-hmm. I can remember when I had a Tennessee driver's license in college, and it didn't have a picture on it. New York neither. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and things like that. <laughs> And then there was a lot of states for many years you didn't need one. You know, if you were old enough to drive, they just said, okay, you could drive. You right. know? And, and this so, demonstrates. And the same thing with this uh, medical marijuana stuff and the lab. And so we did reciprocity across the country for, with the labs and with everything. And uh, I think uh, we're on to something here, you know. Well, it demonstrates yeah. the strength of our American Constitution where we have allowed uh, these states to act as social laboratories. Mm-hmm. The problem that we're running into now is when you have a state that has successfully done that as Nevada has in regulating this industry and this this standards industry. Um, now it's convincing the people in Washington to let the rest of the country emulate 
our success. Are you saying we want to be like the Nevada legislators? No, I'm, we want, I'm not saying we that we... want to be like the volunteers of Although we if we had a part-time government in Washington, D.C., that might not be the worst thing that happened to us. <laughs> Michael, I think you got a story about these legislators. Why don't you tell us uh, about that? You know, that? I, I've, I've testified before <laughs> the legislature the last four sessions. I like these guys and all, but I'll tell you what. The Legislative Council Bureau, who, is, who essentially writes the language for the, um, uh, for the statutes, had, and so they assist lawmakers. They have sent a 28-page denial letter after the Associated Press requested a week's worth of emails from the accounts of four of their legislative leaders. The agency also denied a request for those lawmakers' calendars from the first week of February. They say the legislature doesn't qualify as a governmental entity under the public records law, and re releasing said emails and calendars could chill legislative discussion. Officials at Governor Brian Sadoval's office have responded to the same request by providing a detailed calendar. So the legislature... <laughs> is saying that they're not a governmental entity they the have people no who have, the people who advise the legislature on what and what not to say basically their legal department yeah. has instructed the associated press that they're not required to turn over any information concerning their their clients right. which is Hey, yes, and, and the, <laughs> the, the legislature writes the statute and has imposed transparency rules on all sorts of other agencies and, and governmental mm. uh, entities within the state. And they're exempting themselves. Well, Sounds you see, like but the legislature. Well, but yeah. see, what the legislature can say, well, we didn't vote on this. This is we didn't even we weren't even in session when yeah. this decision was made. Mm -hmm. This was made by the lawyers. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we don't uh, know what to tell you. Sounds and, like the uh, case of what's good for the goose doesn't apply to us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so folks, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they're supposed you know the legislative council is supposed to be advising the legislature, but really they're you know they're just there to protect them also. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. So uh, I, my advice is uh, make sure you register to vote. Mm -hmm. Make sure you join We Can, 702.org. Join us and come to the workshops uh, as, between now and uh, the next legislative session, which starts February of next year. And uh, let these legislators so know that soon. they need to be uh, transparent and they need to be accountable and that we have issues and we, we want them to take these issues serious. That's we're sick right. and tired of it. 16 years, we're going to fix this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so you have the opportunity. Yeah. We're in election season now. There are plenty of candidates for assembly and state senate running. And get out to their campaign events, drink their free soda, eat their yeah. free hamburgers, and give them a piece of your mind. Let them know what's important to you, which is moving the, the medical cannabis industry forward. And in this case, making sure that they play by the rules they set for everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to brag a little bit about... Uh, we. You know, for about eight years, we have been meeting at the Coffee, Bean, and Tea across from the UNLV Student Center for eight years, and God bless them. We love them, and we thank them for that. But we've got, we've got a new meeting place, and we had our first meeting at the uh, Source Dispensary on Rainbow and, and uh, Sahara this last Saturday in their meeting room, and we had a wonderful time there. And yeah, uh, house, they gave us all these little coupons for 20% off if you were a, a licensed patient to buy something at the dispensary. One item, on 20 day. Yeah, one item, 20% oh, okay. off. And I got to tell you, plus my senior discount, <laughs> and, and it was incredible. Yeah, they allow you to get <laughs> I got a senior combined. discount, yeah, you can 20% stack them. off. I bought a little item, and I'll tell you what, it was a good price item. Mm -hmm. and, and what I really like about this is it says right on there, it pays to be a Weekend member because you got a 20% discount for Weekend. There you go. Very nice. yeah. So wellness education advocates of Nevada, it pays to join. And for so for as little as four dollars and twenty cents a month, you can be a recurring member and help us out and help us uh, run this ball from here to heaven. And <laughs> that uh, sounds like and a if good you're interested my promo. If, if you're interested in coming to any of our patient meetings, we hold them monthly on the second Saturday of every month. It right. is at the right next door to the source dispensary. That's the door to the right at suite number eight. Uh, and uh, it's from two to four on mm -hmm. the second Saturday of every month. Right. And you do do not have to be a patient to attend. No. Um, this is information for everybody. If you have a family member who's thinking about getting into this or anything like that, bring them on down. Let them meet the community. We'll answer any questions for them. And you know, and if you are a patient, take advantage right. of the discount that they give. Yeah. You if you're right not there. a patient and you want to know what it's like to be a patient, or if you want to get as educated as as Cindy here, then uh, we have wonderful speakers that come down like Cindy that talk to us and and they talk to the people that uh, aren't patients too 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you can take a tour. They'll gladly give you a tour of the facility or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, these are all good things. So, yeah, it pays to be great. involved and get involved mm -hmm. with good people and let's network. L let me ask you one more thing about the the where the the industry is right now. I, I heard just yesterday that um, another dispensary, Nevada Pure, is going to uh, start offering RSO within the next week, which is Rick Simpson Oil, sometimes called Phoenix Tears. And I'm wondering whether anyone has so far uh, come to DigiPath to have these thing to have this this oil tested because um, this is something that a lot of patients around the country have looked for because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about the efficacy uh, against cancerous growths and so I think this will be a big thing in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. well, uh, we haven't seen that specific product mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we would love to see it. Um, we've looked at just a few CBD enriched products. Mm -hmm. um, you know, CBD is a rare, yeah. <laughs> it's the rarity. Yeah. So um, we look forward to seeing more of that. Yeah. And, and, and I hope we do too, because mm -hmm. we certainly, you know, if, if we can make a dent in cancer in this Yeah, country, right. particularly be before thing. we have to go the prescription drug route, which right. is rapidly approaching, I fear. Right. Well, look, what I like about the CBDs is like, I like the tea, okay? <clears throat> and it doesn't have THC in it. So if I'm taking a road trip or something, or I'm in an airplane and I can drink my tea, mm -hmm. it kind of takes the edge off and settles uh, my muscles and things down to where I can get through that. Well, Cindy, so, I, I just want to thank you for coming in yeah. today. Well, thanks it's for inviting me. Thank great you. Yeah, to be educated. Great. We, we barely touched any of the news. It was yeah. such great discussion. Well, I'd love yeah. to come um, back. So. We, do have, we do have a couple events we want to talk, talk to you about. We got our uh, St. Fatty's Day weekend potluck for patients and caregivers this weekend, this Saturday from 1 to 6. Uh, go to our website, weekend702.org, for more information on that. We have our grow class uh, this Sunday, Grow Nevada, which is held at our at our corporate offices over on Flamingo and Spencer. So if you're interested in learning how to grow yourself, um, go onto our website, sign up for that. We have our patient support group in Pahrump, which is Saturday, March 26th, over at Johnny's American. You find more information on our website there also. And Digipath is doing an event on uh, Sunday, April 24th. Uh, it's a patient day you guys are doing over there, right? Right, right. Yep. And if you want any more information on that, go to digipathlabs.com and they'll have the information there for you on that. Right. And search the internet because almost every week, this week in Pahrump, a new dispensary is going to be opening up and don't every about week all over Las Vegas, <laughs> uh, there, things are happening. So yeah, uh, don't forget get about the 420 party either. Weekend oh, yeah. 702.org. April, yeah, April 16th. Yeah, that's going to be a big one out there in Boulder City. So clear your calendars for that. And see you next time. See you next see time you. on the radio.